Okay, great. So welcome everybody. Today we're really, uh, it's fantastic that we have a discussion finally on representations, something that a lot of us have been wondering and thinking about. And there's always very, very lively discussions on Twitter and all sorts of other venues too, I'm sure. And so today what we're gonna do is we're gonna try, the way we're gonna to be trying to structure these neuroscience and philosophy salons is to have as much discussion as possible. It's really hard without having it last several hours and I, everyone is incredibly busy. So what we've been trying to do is have shorter presentations by the people who are invited to lead the discussions. So first, Russ Poldrack is, who is a professor of psychology at Stanford and um, has investigated the brain systems for decision-making and executive function and has been interested in foundational questions regarding the understanding of mind and brain for, for a long time. Uh, Russ is gonna start by touching upon some of the things that he covered in a recent paper um, that I was was shared uh, together with the call of this 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 event, and he's going to be leading this for 20 25 minutes, discussing his view or some of some of his views on representation or some views that could be useful to understand representations in the brain. After that, so that's going to take 20 25 minutes. Again, keeping it short so that we can have discussion at the end. After that. Ines Ippolito. Ines is a postdoctoral researcher and lecturer at the Humboldt University. She is also an affiliate of the Theoretical Neurobi Neurobiology Group at UCL, University College London. She's a philosopher and dynamical systems theorist. One of her areas of research considers the ontological status of representations. So she is in the right place here to let us know, uh, to present her views and, and, and expand on, on the discussion. So Ines is gonna start after Russ and, and speak for let's say eight or so minutes. And after that, Michael Anderson, who is a professor in philosophy of science and the head of the, a lab called, and this is the, the coolest um, lab name I've seen in a long time, the Eclectic Mind Research Group, the e EMRG group at the University of Western Ontario. For obvious reasons, you pronounce that emerge. Ah, okay. <laughs> oh, for obvious reasons. <laughs> yeah, never assume obvious in the head of others. <laughs> but nonetheless, for obvious reasons is the eMERGE lab. And um, one of his areas of research, as many of us know, is the development of the neural reuse hypothesis. And he's going to be following up uh, in this and also doing a commentary on Russ's presentation and uh, wrapping up this first phase of discussion. And the subsequent phase of discussion, what we're really excited about is to see as many of us across all levels, we try to do this uh, as uh, horizontally, there's no uh, order of anything here. Let's just to have a, a broad ended discussion, uh, open ended discussion here that everyone should view, feel very comfortable in talking about these, these questions that we all struggle with. So there's no seniority or anything like that. So please uh, let's, um, let's have an engaging discussion after this first part. And hopefully some of us can stick around for a little longer so that we can uh, stay for an hour or an hour and a little bit. So having said that, I'm gonna get started. And Russ, I think you have your slides. You can just uh, take it away. All right. Well, thanks for the invitation and for putting this together. Um, and glad to see there's such an eclectic group of people in the audience. This should be fun. Yeah, so I'm going to um, kind of focus in on some of the points that I raised in this uh, synthes paper that came out earlier this year, which had grown out of a conference that um, was put on here at Stanford a couple of years ago um, by uh, Jesse Wright, Philippe de Regard, and Sarah Robbins. Um, so if you if you look at the way that neuroscientists use the term representation, you have no idea that it's actually controversial anywhere else in the world because we throw it around, you know, in in lots of different ways. And in general, it's meant to refer to some sort of 
systematic relationship between things in the world, which are, again, uncontroversial amongst neuroscientists, and the activities of neurons. Um, and so the, the sort of canonical you know, ver examples are, for example, the topographical organization of primary sensory cortices, which you see through this famous you know, sensory homunculus, or, you know, for example, in the, the visual cortex, starting, you know, with like this, you know, famous early work by Roger Tutel showing the topographic organization and the, the visual cortex. Um, now, you know, fast forward a few years, and we see that we don't have to have sort of macroscopic spatial isomorphism, you know, we can have, for example, you know, spatially selective cells in various places in the uh, medial temporal lobe, play cells, grid cells, head direction cells, border cells. But again, the point is that, you know, there's some systematic relationship between things in the world and the, the activity of particular neurons, even if in this case, they're not laid out in any sort of topographical map. Um, and, you know, more recently, we've started to see lots of talk about not just sort of, you know, the the, the things that the, the particular, you know, ways that individual neurons fire, but really thinking about sort of representational spaces. Um, and this is, you know, famous work from Nico Kriegescourt and colleagues showing, you know, across lots of different types of images, responses of uh, populations of either, you know, uh, monkey, non-human primate or human uh, infrotemporal cortex. So, you know, there's lots of different ways in which this term is used to kind of relate to things out in the world. I'm going to come back at the end to talk about kind of the philosophical interpretation of what a representation is. I want to now turn to the way that people are increasingly using it in computer science. You know, sort of traditionally, it was using computer science just to refer to kind of the the re, you know, sort of kind of the recoding of information in kind of a lossy way, but uh, but increasingly, it's used to refer to sort of you know particularly the the kind of um, work that's done in um, deep learning, which is which is often you know referred to as representation learning, which has to do with the the learning of basically transformations of of inputs from the world, in this case, say from the retina, um, into um, some sort of format that supports a particular task. So let's say your task is to say, what is this thing in the picture? And that's my cat Coco in a hat. I wanted to make her famous by putting her in a figure in my paper. So that's what I did. Um, and um, so the, you know, the, some of the things that you might need to do are you know, like figure out where are the edges, you know, what's how bright is are the things, what is the object in the photo. Uh, and so the goal of representation learning is to basically take those like initial say pixel inputs and transform them into a format that can support performance on some kind of particular task and the, the network learns these uh, these representations through various algorithms that have become really powerful. Um, and the, you know, you can see how powerful they are just looking at how things changed. And this is, you know, this is the state of the art two years ago. I mean, this field's moving incredibly fast. So it's it's still, you know, much better than it was in 2019. But you know, if you if you give this picture to VGG19, which was state of the art about seven years ago, it kind of thought it was maybe a cat, maybe a bath towel, you know, fast forward five years, and it is pretty certain this is a cat despite the fact that it's wearing a, a fuzzy hat on its head. Okay, so what you might ask, what do deep networks have to do with brains? And well, you know, you, you probably know that the design of hierarchical convolutional neural networks like the one that you see down here and that has been, you know, kind of increasingly powerful, um, it was sort of initially inspired by the structure of the primate visual cortex um, in early work of people like Jan LeCun. Um, I, I'm going to kind of talk through a, a set of ideas about how, you know, how we might sort of get insights into the brain from these sorts of networks. I'm going to focus on work by my colleague Dan Yeamans and Jim DiCarlo, other people like Nico Kriegescourt and others have done sort of similar work. Um, so the, the idea is basically to, you know, what, what Dan and, and Jim and others have done is basically, you know, train a network to perform a task. And in this case, the task is um, object identification. So, you know, I show you a picture and you tell me, is this a human face or a chair or a car or whatever else it might be? So the network is basically trained using sort of standard learning algorithms and maybe searching across network architectures to kind of optimally perform that task. Then what they do sort of in parallel is take those same pictures and show them to monkeys and record from various places in the, the visual cortex to ask, you know, how do neurons 
respond to those individual images. Um, the network doesn't know anything about the way that neurons in the brain respond. Um, but nonetheless, if you look at activity in you know, various layers of this neural network and try to use it to basically predict the activity of neurons in the primate brain, what you see is that um, early parts of the network are highly predictive of early parts of the visual system. Later parts of the network are predictive of later parts of the visual system. Um, and you know, in some of the, some studies, it's possible to predict almost all of the explainable variants in the activity of neurons using these models. And in fact, um, in general, you know, the the neural network simply trained to do the task can perform as well at predicting the activity of neurons as. A, a model that was actually trained to predict the activity of neurons. Um, so there's there's you know a, an incredible incredibly powerful argument to be made for a, a you know a pretty strong isomorphism here between kind of what these artificial neural networks are doing and what the natural neural networks in the in the primate and human brain do. This is just an example showing, and this is relatively old work. It's it's gotten even better from here. You know, showing that these um, behavior optimized neural networks are, you know, strongly predictive of, of neural data. And in fact, you can go a step farther. Um, this is uh, work by uh, Jim DiCarlo's lab from a couple of years ago, um, doing what they call deep image synthesis, where they basically train a neural network to, um, to perform images and then use it to basically figure out what are the, the kinds of images that any particular neuron is sort of responsive to and create these things they call synthetic controller images that are actually that drive activity in those neurons more strongly than any natural any of the images in their naturalistic image database. Um, so again, you know, providing some some deep insights into the degree to which you know the there's there's a really strong relationship between what's being done in that artificial neural network and what's being done in um, in primate brains. So one way to think about you know learning um, is as sort of approximating some kind of function, right? So for example, you know this is the the color version of of Coco in a hat. Um, something happens you know in a brain um, that leads one to say something about that picture, like Coco in a hat, ha. Um, and you can think, think of that as basically like some function of this, the input here, you know, leads to this thing. And then the question is, what's the nature of that function? Um, so let's think for a moment about like how hard a problem this is. We'll just take the grayscale version, 256 bit grayscale version of Coco in a hat. 14 by 34 by 1434 by 1076. That's about one and a half million pixels. So of all the number of possible images that could be generated, you know, out of out of this particular uh, format is huge, right? Um, and so the question is, you know, how can a system with say tens of millions of parameters like some of these hierarchical convolutional neural networks have, how could it learn to classify images in this high dimensional space so well? And a problem that we run into here is well known in machine learning, the curse of dimensionality, right? So the number of samples that you need to span a space of features grows exponentially with the number of features. So for a single pixel, we would just need 256 samples to fully sample that space. For two pixels, we need 65,000 and so on. That gets big really quickly, right? Um, so for the for that Coco image, it would if you could process images at one nanosecond per image, it would take orders of magnitude longer than the time elapsed since the Big Bang to go through all the possible versions of that image. Um, and so this basically says that a model free model free learner, which is basically a learner that simply just learns an, a label for any particular image without knowing anything about the relationships between image, could never obtain enough experience to learn labels for all the possible images. There's just no time. And so what this highlights is basically the, the necessity of some kind of inductive bias for intelligent behavior. So the argument here is that the only way to behave effectively in a high dimensional world is to project that input onto a low dimensional space. Um, and, um, and what this allows one to do then is generalize 
across whatever you know dimensions you're not that, that you've sort of flattened over. Um, and that generalization is only going to be successful if that projection accurately reflects the structure that's generating the inputs. Right? There's lots of there's an infinite number of possible projections of that high dimensional space into a low dimensional space. Um, and that projection needs to work by which by work, I mean, in some way reflect the structure of the generate the causal processes that are generating the world that's being perceived, such as the physics of the world. And I want to the, the, the fundamental argument here is that those projections from that high dimensional space of the world that, that hits our retinas into the low dimensional spaces in our brains, those are representations. Um, there's a, a really interesting paper that came out a few years ago um, by uh, Henry Lin and colleagues, which basically tried to sort of make this argument in the context of why what they call deep and cheap learning works so well. Like, why is it that you know models with relatively few parameters can learn these really complex things so well? The argument that they make is that the structure of convolutional neural networks basically encodes an inductive bias that matches the generative structure of natural images that comes ultimately from the fundamental physics of our universe. The fact that it's low dimensional, it's local, it's symmetric, and it's hierarchical. And then the compositional nature of those networks, right, where you're basically composing a bunch of layers, allows the, the number of necessary parameters to grow linearly rather than exponentially. So where do these representations come from in our brains? Well, they, they probably come from a couple of places, right? One, some of them are encoded in the architecture of the mammalian visual system, right? The fact that the system is convolutional um, and hierarchical encodes the structure of the world in saying. But obviously, we also learn things through experience. We know, for example, that if you don't see vertical lines during development, you're not going to have representations of vertical lines in your brain. Um, and so clearly, experience is necessary for some of that. So I'm going to turn in the last couple of minutes to kind of the, the philosophical question here, right? And, um, and you know, I find the, the philosophical uh, literature on representations incredibly frustrating because I, could, I felt like I could never pin down anybody on what would it actually take, right? So Ramsey talks about the job description, right? Um, he says, are there mindless systems in which an internal element is performing a role that's most naturally or intuitively or justifiably or beneficially viewed as representational in nature? That doesn't tell me what it means to be viewed as representational in nature. Um, and I, the, I think that, you know, Nick Shea's criteria come sort of closest to being one that I could at least get my my head around and try to flesh out, um, which has several parts. So it, we need an explanatum concerning how the system operates or behaves in relation to its environment, a putative representational explanation of that explanatum, an account of how that explanation succeeds, and a characterization of the kind of, proper, kind of properties, the representational properties the system would have to be for that explanation B to succeed in explaining A in accordance with the account C. So I'm gonna try to give you that really quickly. So what's the explanatum? The explanatum is our ability and the ability of hierarchical neural, artificial neural networks to um, recognize images and generalize across image manipulations, right? You can all look at this, these different versions of the image and say, yeah, it's cocoa in a hat. Um, but, uh, you know, that's, a, that's something that's in, in need of explanation. It's not an easy problem. Until a few years ago, it was a really hard problem. A putative representational explanation. Well, this is basically the explanation I gave you um, in terms of, you know, how these hierarchical convolutional neural networks work. And I'll, you know, I'll, I'll say at the outset that, you know, clearly this is explaining one small part of the what I think is, you know, the representational capacity of organisms uh, up to humans. Um, this is sort of the, I think the the best worked out example. And right now there's just sort of a an article of faith that we'll be able to take these approaches or other types of computational approaches and get to the same type of representational explanation. Um, but I would argue that at least for the, in the context of um, a visual object recognition, this is a representational explanation of this computational explanation down here with these intermediate representational layers is an explanation of how that brain works. How does it succeed? Well, it allows human object, human level object recognition by the computational models prediction of neural responses in primate brains, 
generation of stimuli that drive neurons stronger than any of the natural images that have been tried and so on, right? So this seems like a, in terms of like, you know, scientific explanations for representational capacities, this seems like a pretty strong set of, uh, of, uh, of results that suggest that that, that uh, explanation works. It certainly works better than any explanation that we've had up to, to now. A characterization of the kind of properties that the representational properties of the system would have to be for those things to succeed. Well, um, one, you know, it needs, we need some sort of causal dependency, right? We need the putative representations to be reliably triggered by things in the world. Um, and we need them to be, you know, sort of, uh, well, sorry, this causal dependency is necessary, but not sufficient for representational status, right? Um, we don't, you know, we don't want to attribute represent, or at least philosophers don't want to attribute representational status to something that's simply a receptor. So how do we know that this is not just a receptor? I'll come back to that in a second. Um, I mean, another, what other, you know, what else have I said about the kind of properties that the representations need to have? Well, they need to have some sort of structural relationship between the things in the representations and the visual world. Um, and the argument here is that the projection of visual input onto this low dimensional manifold that reflects the physics of the world and allows successful generalization is the only way that you can make sense of both natural and artificial object recognition systems and the, the isomorphisms that we see between them. And finally, you know, there's a lot of focus on decoupleability, right? Can we, can the representations play their role in the absence of the triggering stimulus? And here, I mean, this has become increasingly clear from recent work, both in, you know, in rodents and in humans. This is a cool paper that I'll come back to at the very end, which basically showed that you could induce in mice uh, patterns of activity in the visual cortex uh, and, you know, on a particular task that would basically drive behavior in a way that looks pretty much exactly like how the animal would behave if the stimulus was present, but there's no stimulus present. There's just a pattern of activity being imposed on their, um, on their visual cortex. I'm going to show you just a short video um, of some, some recent results. Uh, and you won't be able to hear it, I don't think, unless you hear it through my mic, but it has subtitles. Um, and this is basically an example of, of stimulation of the the, one of the face selective regions in the human brain in this uh, epilepsy patient. They're stimulating that part of the brain and he basically sees a face in a non-face stimulus. <laughs> So we don't even need optogenetics to, to you know, drive inception. Um, and so it's very difficult to explain that kind of inception of, you know, of uh, perceptual contents without some kind of reference to representations that are triggered uh, by the stimulus or by, from the world or by an electrical stimulus or an optogenetic stimulus into the brain. Now I want to um, end by talking about dynamical systems. And I, I have to say, I was glad to see uh, Tony Chimero in the audience because his book, I, I, I found one of the clearest when reading the literature on representations, it really was you know, one of the clearest uh, explications of the issues. Uh, and, you know, and Mike Anderson and I have long you know, had sort of discussions about representation versus dynamics. And I have to say that I've, you know, I've come around a little bit and actually have a student in my lab, Grace Huckins, who's now working on kind of, you know, trying to relate dynamical and representational approaches. And I think what's really interesting, I'm going to come back to the paper I mentioned a moment ago, the inception paper. Um, what's really interesting is that if you look across neuroscience, that the, you know, in philosophy, it's often framed as like you have to either believe in dynamics or believe in representations. Um, and these two ways of thinking are really being mixed together right now um, in neuroscience increasingly. Um, and I think that from the standpoint of representations as basically projections into a lower dimensional space and then movement along you know, the manifolds in those spaces, this is a completely natural way to think about things, right? That you could have representations that in some sense represent 
you know, states, state, you know, positions in a state space in a dynamical system. So I wanted to go back to this paper I mentioned. It turns out that they weren't in this paper um, where they're, you know, in, in imposing, um, you know, visual percepts. They weren't uh, driving the activity of individual neurons. What they were doing was imposing dynamical patterns. So basically they, they looked at the dynamical patterns of activity that came out when mice looked at real stimuli and then imposed those dynamical patterns, right? And so, you know, neuroscientists have no problem talking about dynamical patterns and neural representations, you know, in the same paragraph in their, uh, in their paper. So I wanna end by basically, you know, saying that I think we, you know, we can take advantage of, you know, these, uh, these ideas that are coming out of, um, out of machine learning to help us understand how we might profitably think about, you know, what the role of representations are in brains. Um, and further, I wanna, I, I hope that I've convinced you, I'm happy to discuss the argument that um, the only way for an organism to succeed in adaptively behaving in the world is to have those kinds of representations, that to have the right kinds of representations that map onto the structure of the world. Um, and then I'll also look forward to talking about sort of how we think about this in the context of dynamics. So let me stop sharing and uh, thank you. Okay, great, thanks. That was awesome. So Ines, do you wanna jump in right in and uh, tell us your view on the points that Russ brought up or other points that you wanna add to the discussion overall? Yes, uh, for sure. Um... I'm just not sure if I can now. I don't think I'm a host now or a co-host. Oh, okay. Let me just. <laughs> I think I lost that power. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I think I, I, I can just easily you. just click the right button this time. Let's see here. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. C can you see my screen? Yes, we do. Okay. Cool. Perfect. All right, so um, yeah, I think um, this is um, extraordinary work um, that you are doing, uh, Russ. I, I was really pleased to uh, not only read the paper, but now seeing the, the presentation, um, it was uh, even much more uh, impressive. And I'm always fascinated by uh, how much uh, we can get and how much we understand um, about cognition and um, and um, and neuronal activity from um, deep learning and neural networks. So it's really great stuff that you're sharing with us. Um, and also I'd like first to thank uh, uh, the invite to uh, be here and participate uh, in these uh, beautiful discussions. Um, so yeah, so uh, let me just um, uh, uh, start my own, uh, my own um, slides and my thoughts um, on the matter. So, let me, yeah. Okay, so um, to give a little bit of context, um, because I'm coming from a, a slightly different angle uh, than Ross's uh, paper, um, as a little bit of context, um, it, it, we all know uh, this is no news under the sun, but uh, that humans can explore and understand the world precisely by engaging in different sorts of activities, but spe specifically uh, the topic here today is that they can in engage in activities that involve representations even if this is not all that we can do or not, um, uh, is not uh, how we reduce the forms of engagement that we have with the world. Um, but we can do that and we can do that because we've been enculturated with concepts and uh, we have developed these reasoning skills, uh, for example, by, by, by being taught or learned how to give reasons for action from the narratives that we were told, for example, as we were uh, little uh, growing up. So we can do these forms of representing the world by having these uh, thoughts, beliefs, maps, pictures, we can do all of that, or we can even do more sophisticated stuff, which is precisely this beautiful work that Russ is doing by developing more models to understand cognition and the brain. So that's much more sophisticated, requires much more training. Um, so, but what, I, what, I, what my question and what I like to think about in the work that I do is why should it be the case or why should we accept or take for granted that um, we should attribute this sort of full agent capacity to neuronal activity or cognitive activity itself, or, or let's say to the neurobiological uh, scales. 
So an argument, I think, is very much required um, in the literature for this. But I was reading uh, Ross's paper precisely uh, with this in mind, right? And um, what it tells us in the paper is quite interesting. It tells us that any system that is going to behave intelligently in the world must, must contain representations that reflect the sort, uh, the structure of the world. Um, and then he points out many in many different studies that there's been recent success of artificial neural networks on certain tasks, such as visual object recognition, which reflects the degree to which those systems, like biological brains, exhibit inherent um, inductive biases that reflect the structure of the physical world. So then from this point, um, the argument very much uh, revolves around uh, this sort of like analogy between biological brains also exhibiting these inherent um, inductive biases that reflect the structure of the physical world. So in that sense, uh, if I understand correctly, then biological brains, just like these artificial neural networks, contain representations that reflect the structure of the world. So then uh, my thoughts on the matter and coming from that particularly that question that I always have in mind in the back of my mind um, is precisely to do with um, this idea that I have, and I'm going to just say a few words on this in the, in the next slides, that models and things to be modeled, they are not similar things. So this is what I'm going to try to press against a little bit. Um, so um, my view is that models entail um, the concept and the mathematical machinery that we scientists have been enculturated with, we've been trained, etc. And therefore, and for the reasons that I'm going to indicate, models cannot be ontological dictators. They are, they are very, very useful for what I'm going to say, but I don't think that I'm convinced that um, I can make an ontological claim from a model. Um, so, yeah, so specifically what I uh, emphasize is the distinction between models and the thing that is being modeled. Whatever it is, it can be a storm, it can be the ocean, it can be the brain. Um, so the idea, um, the, or at least my reason is that um, humans and scientists, scientists included are enculturated with language and they engage with the world by being what Di Paolo and colleagues um, have called in their book, um, linguistic bodies. And in explaining the world in daily life or in explaining the world scientifically, um, we humans can make use of these symbols and these reasoning skills or even more sophisticated tools that we develop as scientists. So we can then do something that uh, brings us here today, which is we can develop these representational models to understand um, the world. Now, my question is precisely whether it follows that the thing to be explained must involve the enculturated machinery that we use to explain, such as models, representations, content, etc. Because uh, maybe here an example, uh, a mundane example is useful because um, in, um, in science, we every day we develop models to understand the world. And we develop models by using laws, for example, the law of gravity is one of them. And my question and what I think about is whether from the fact that we can have a model that explains and predicts something as simple as the falling of an object, for example, a stone, whether it follows that the stone represents the laws by which it falls. So can we make that kind of ontological claim from the model? Are we allowed to do that? So that's what I think about. And then I found it very interesting in the paper because um, it seems that um, there is that kind of like sort of parallel. So it got me thinking. Let me just uh, read out uh, the particular part that I thought it was quite interesting um, in Ross's paper. Um, so it tells us that as deep learning systems have become increasingly powerful, neuroscientists have begun to investigate the parallels between those models and the biological brains. The specific hierarchical architecture of both artificial HCNNs and the primate visual system gives rise to a set of representations that reflect the hierarchical and compositional structure of the visual world. And I'm 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 almost on, on board with with with, uh, with what's been say with what's been said. What I'm concerned about is the ontological claims that we um, we can make. And let me say a little bit a little bit more about that. Um, what I'm thinking about is that there is a specific issue or difficulty that unites us all uh, in cognitive science when we are doing cognitive modeling um, or even working on neuroimaging. 
uh, studies, for example, because competing the dynamics of an entire system, like, for example, the brain or um, any interesting uh, cognitive behavior involves too many variables and these, all these interrelations that make it so untractable. It's very difficult to, to track that. So um, then uh, what we need to figure out is how to compete on a low level uh, one that is mathematically and computationally tractable, the activity that has been generated in a high level space, which means any cognitive behavior that is interesting for us to, uh, to study. Um, and this is a typical problem that is posed to computational neuroscience. This is uh, not news, but I think it's important to highlight for the point that I want to make. Um, faced with this issue, then the common procedure is um, dimensionality reduction, um, which is again, very, very common. Um, this only means that uh, then we have to use methods of approximation or optimization uh, that will involve representing in a low dimension, so in a model, some uh, meaningful properties of the data collected from uh, the activity of interest or what we want to study. Now, the issue is that, uh, as you see, the data collected uh, was generated by an activity that lives in high dimension. So, because it was developed by what we can um, uh, call a complex system. So then we have here a little bit of a, of a pickle because we are dealing with the, with the behavior that has been generated in high dimension, but then we need to develop a model that explains that behavior. But we don't have the tractability that we would like. So then we have um, to represent that or gain um, some um, understanding of uh, that behavior in the methods that we can um, in low dimension. So then what happens is, for example, this is obviously um, a very rough idea um, of the, the steps, but design an experiment, for example, to a neuroimaging study, and then we collect the data um, that has been generated by a neuronal or a cognitive activity. And to make sense of this data, it is very important and very useful that we develop a model which is going to involve a bunch of assumptions, it's going to involve a theory um, uh, that uh, wants to or aims to explain how this data has been generated. Now our model is going to live in a low dimension um, and the activity uh, is going to live uh, in a high dimension. So therefore I want to say, or at least um, this is my what I lean towards that um, we cannot um, say that the model is going to be structurally similar to the phenomenon being studied. Studied, and by saying that, I don't want to. I don't want to um, say that it is not useful. That's not what I'm saying at all. I think it has uh, very important uh, properties, and we gain much knowledge from it. And I'm going to say a few things about that. Now, I think that when we do that, when we do think that the, there is a structural similarity between the model and the phenomenon being studied, and we're not attentive to that. Um, then um, we might be uh, uh, doing that thing that we all know, which is confusing the map with the territory, because we're confusing the models of behavior. So the thing that we want to study um, with the, uh, sorry, so the models that we use to understand something with that something that is the cognitive behavior itself that we want to understand. And the move usually is done or is allowed, philosophically speaking, by taking a realist stand, uh, standpoint. And um, in which we just say that uh, the properties of the scientific model should, should be expected as properties of the scientific object. And I think here there's the conflation. That's exactly where the confusion of map and territory um, come. Uh, and this is by saying that properties of the model representations are therefore properties of the cognitive or neuronal behavior. And I'm not convinced by that. Some implications of this reasoning that I'm, I've been pursuing here um, is that um, I believe, I think that models are quite useful to explain and predict cognitive and neuronal behavior. We've been doing extraordinary research and understanding more and more um, about uh, neuronal and cognitive behavior. So I think that there is an epistemic value in models, in cognitive models, because, uh, but, but I also think that because the model lives in low dimension and the cognitive phenomenon lives in high dimension. And this is uh, sort of like deals with the practice of um, being a cognitive science um, kind of scientist in a lab. Um, that kind of comes uh, contradicting the claims that uh, we may be making in philosophy by not understanding that practice. And I'm very interested to know what Russ has got to say about that. Um, so I think that cognitive modeling has epistemic but not ontological value. And for that reason, um, 
the fact that mo a model is epistemically useful does not legitimize that it should be or should be dictating on ontological properties. Now, this has a little bit of an implication here for um, uh, this particular. Sorry, Ines, but um, uh, we have one more speaker before opening up. Can you maybe a kind of uh, conclude in, in, I don't know, in, in a few minutes or? Absolutely. Yes, for sure. So basically, I just wanted to say that I think that this then is going to have a little bit of an implication for um, precisely the parallel that um, is being um, uh, drawn by Russ. And that's it. That's me. <laughs> yeah, I thought I thought that was the second point of four. So it would be 40 minutes long or so. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> that's it. I'll just stop sharing now. So that's uh, all right. Let, thanks uh, so much. Yeah, thank you. OK, Michael Anderson. Michael. Okay, can you see the screen and hear me okay? Uh, yes, we can. Awesome. So, um, yeah, I, I wanted to just talk about some of the, I think, really big picture things. I love this paper from Russ. It's been really productive for me and for some of my students just thinking through these things. So, I think it's fantastic. Um, uh, There we go. Um, I want to point out that this is uh, the my comments today are, are based on joint work with Heather Champion. I think she's logged in here, so she may have some things to say. I know she would take a very different take uh, in response to Russ than I'm going to take. Um, but the sort of the careful and um, the careful and more thoughtful <laughs> work can be found hopefully soon in this paper that uh, Heather and I wrote together. Uh, which is a response to Russ's paper in, in, in Synthesa. Um, I do want to point out, however, that she's not responsible for the hand grenade I'm about to throw uh, into the mix here. But since this is a salon, Luis, I figured that uh, strong controversial claims are de rigueur, so I'm just going to go for it. By all means. <laughs> um, so look, this is Poldrex Gauntlet. This is not in the paper, but I don't know if Russ will remember this. Um, a few years back, uh, we met at a conference. I can't remember if it was when he came to, to visit us at Western or it was, it was somewhere else, but he was, he was quite concerned for my career. Um, and he, he says to me, you know, how, you know, how's it going? Well, you know, great, Russ. Why? And he says, well, I just get the impression that deep learning is kicking ecological psychology's ass. And I've been thinking about that. I think, you know, since then, I think, I think it was, it's, it's, it, I don't think it's true, um, but that they hit, that's the gauntlet he threw down a few years ago. And so here's me accepting that challenge. What I actually think is that deep learning is kicking representational theory of minds ass. And that Russ's theory of representation is helping us see that that's the case. So why do I think that? Well, look, here's representational theory of mind, the kind of the original idea behind this, this view, right? That the furniture of the mind consists in semantically valuable, intentional mental states capable of being combined and manipulated according to logical or otherwise truth-respecting rules, right? This is a super powerful idea, a very old idea. It goes back to Aristotle, in fact, at least. Uh, um, and, and it's the basis, of course, of, of, of thousands of years of philosophical work. But more importantly for our current discussion, it's, it's responsible, it's, it's behind, it sits behind decades of work in psychology, cognitive psychology in particular. And more recently, it's been taken up, usually implicitly, um, or perhaps at best with a brief nod to Fodor, probably the most miscited philosopher in neuroscience. Uh, in, in the neurosciences. So let's investigate this idea. Let's take stock of how representational theory of mind has, um, has fared inside of neuroscience. So I'm gonna assume, and I think this is right, in fact, that, that, that Rust has correctly identified and characterized the entities deserving to be, deserving to be described as neural rep representations. So that's just, we can have an argument about that, of course, but I'm not gonna have that argument. I just wanna say, okay, that's what neural representations are. How do they compare to the representations envisioned in the representational theory of mind? So let's talk about features for a minute. 
Now, in psychology, what features are, are introspectable, decomposable, semantically interpretable elements of experience. So these are pictures from Anne Treisman. People will be familiar with her work, I, I hope. Um, and so features are color, features are edges, features are shape. And sometimes th things are super abstract, like closure and things like that. But those are what features are, right? You can perceive things and you can think, oh, I could break this perceptual image down into parts. And then we can investigate you know, whether uh, and how those parts get uh, represented or, or, or uh, interpreted in, in experience. But here are the features that we get from the neurosciences. These are not introspectable. They're not decomposable. They're not semantically interpretable. They are not elements of experience. You no, know, Russ in his paper says that, oh, this is fuzzy legs and floppy ears. But come on, it, this is as likely to be, I don't know, Kali at a disco or monkey with a carburetor installed in its head um, as, as these other potential uh, these other potential uh, epistemic interpretations. And then the ones he showed us in his talk uh, in represented in, 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 in panel B down here. Yeah, I, I believe that those kinds of features are an important part of the causal uh, underpinnings of our ability to perceive things, but I can't introspect any of those things. I can never get down to that level in, uh, in introspecting my experience. So we've got an interesting disconnect already between what uh, deep learning and what neuroscience is telling us about these low level uh, features and, and what the initial intent behind representational theory of mind was. Compositionality. Again, in psychology, in philosophy, the meaning of complex structures comes from the meanings of the individual elements according to maybe only partially, but nevertheless specifiable rules, right? But here, what we have in neuroscience is that these representations afford mechanical or mathematical compositionality, right? We know this because you can take a feature vector and reproduce the original image. So they're clearly compositional in some sense, but they're not compositional in the sense that was originally intended by the representational theory of mind. There's not semantic compositionality here. Representations just in general. Now, in psychology, representations stand in for, they point to, they track, or they offer other intentional traction on parts of the world. What it looks like to me is that in this case, what representations are, they're information carrying entities, but they don't track features of the world because they can't be related directly to floppy ears or uh, blue eyes or, or whatever. Rather, what they do is they track or they stand in for, or maybe perhaps are, mathematical abstractions or transformations of that world. So these are the representation spaces that Russ referred to. Um, and so there's this really interesting disconnect, as I say, between what these entities are doing for us and the original uh, idea behind representational theory of mind. And then isomorphism. Um, Russ uh, mentioned this as well. It's, it's a very important part of the paper. Um, in psychology, this means that relationships in the world are largely preserved in the relationships between representations and or their parts, right? That's what isomorphism is meant to capture. But in fact, at least in deep learning and the hierarchy of convolutional neural networks that Russ uh, uh, discusses, convolution destroys and rewrites those relationships. Those isomorphism, isomorphisms have just simply disappeared. Um, and then this is, I, I don't want to dwell too much on this, but rationality, right? The, the whole, uh, uh, one of the most important ideas behind RTM was that representations are linked to one another by logical truth preserving operations. But in neuroscience, these representations, they capture underlying statistical structure, but they have no regard to rational inference. That's just not the role they're playing at all. Now, and I want to absolutely acknowledge this, there absolutely is a systematic empirical relationship between the entities extracted by HCCMs and we're going to presume the brain and features of the world. But that relationship looks nothing like what was envisioned by representational theory of mind. It looks nothing like 
what was envisioned by cognitive psychology, at least classical cognitive psychology. I'm thinking Am Treisman in particular. Um, so why is that important? Well, I think it opens a large explanatory gap between neuroscience and psychology. Cognitive neuroscience purports to be investigating the same sorts of entities, features, and representations that are at play in cognitive psychology. But if Russ is right, and I think he is, that's not in fact what's happening. What neuroscience is discovering is something quite different from the kinds of entities that play an explanatory role in psychology. Uh, and by the way, for students here, I, I think there's a really interesting, pro there's several interesting projects here. But one would be, how would you then reinterpret the vast body of support for feature integration theory? That's Ann Treisman's main uh, theory about how we perceive features and they get built up into complex objects and whatnot. H how would you actually rethink this in light of this account of what neuroscience representations turn out to be? Because we've got a gap here, right? The features of Treisman's view and the features in Poldrack's view, it's very hard to see how they match up to one another. Uh, and now from my standpoint, uh, here's some good news. What has been shown in the presentation and the paper is that one can do sophisticated cognitive things like object categorization without the social representations envisioned by representational theory of mind. Because HCNNs do that. Uh, and in fact, Poldrack representations, now forevermore, this is what they'll be called, um, Poldrack representations are compatible with radical embodied cognitive science. They're compatible with Gibsonian accounts of perception. They're compatible with resonance theories of how the brain relates to the external world. And I think, you know, Russ uh, sort of alludes to this with his openness to dynamical systems uh, explanations. And so, but the, 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 the point where we may still differ is that he wants representational explanations. And I agree that if the things that he's identified as representations are representations, we can call them representational explanations, but they're just not very much like the kinds of explanations envisioned by, say, uh, um, in the job description challenge that envisioned by representational theory of mind. Anyway, so my conclusion then is that RTM's ass is being duly kicked by the very computational sets of explanations that were purported initially to vindicate RTM. Excellent. Thanks. All right. Thanks. So, Russ, uh, do you want to take a few minutes to sure. bring things back and say your perspective on on Inesis and and Michael's points, and and then we we open it more broadly, but maybe briefly give you a chance to reframe or address yep. some of the issues that came up. Definitely. Yeah. So, I I mean, these are both awesome. Uh, Talks and thanks to both of you for for doing this. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna start with uh, with recency first and just say I, I actually don't have that much to say about this is the first time I will ever say this. I really don't disagree with Michael Anderson about anything that he just said. Um, no, I'm you know I, I my my takeaway from this is basically so much the worse for classical RTM. You know, and I think that, you know, one, there's, you know, you could, you could say, why do we need representational talk at all, right? And we would just call these something else. Um, and there's some chat to that uh, effect as well. I think that loses the, you know, some of the utility of the kind of thinking that we get from, from, you know, thinking about kind of hierarchical models in machine learning, for example. Um, but maybe we need instead to talk about a new representational theory of mind that basically will take these insights from, you know, cause I think that, you know, the, the, when we talk about representational theory of mind, this is basically like, you know, a philosophical reinterpretation of like 1960s, 1970s cognitive psychology, right? Um, and I think even within cognitive psychology, I think there's a lot of people who now do, you know, modeling work that wouldn't really make contact with that kind of, you know, representational theory of mind. So I think what we need is a new representational theory of mind, and it may or may not work um, to, to address the kind of, you know, issues that both of you raised. Um, the, the only, I guess the only one kind of, you know, um, one small thing I would pick at is, you know, the point that you try to make about rationality, about not seeing 
you know, rationality within what's going on here. And I think that just because we don't kind of, just because it doesn't pop out at us in a very simple way, doesn't mean that, so, so for example, you know, you could, there are almost certainly, you know, Bayesian reinterpretations of what these models are doing. They could reframe it in terms of some sort of Bayesian inference, right? And I think that the fact that we've moved into kind of a probabilistic frame as opposed to the, the kind of, you know, logical frame in which the original RTM was written. I mean, most theories, you know, if you look in psychology, a ton of the theories now are probabilistic theories, right? So I think that's just a, a natural move from a, from a lot of different directions. Um, so, so I'll, I'll, I'll stop there on, on Mike's and then just sort of circle back to, uh, to Inez's talk. Um, and I think, so, I mean, fortunately, one of the nice things about not being a philosopher is I can just sort of punt on metaphysics and just say, hey, my job is, is an epistemic job, not an ontological job in some sense, but obviously I need an ontology to, to do the epistemic work. Um, and, and I guess I'm sort of, um, I'm, I guess I'm a, I'm a pragmatist about ontology in some sense because I think that you know we we need an ontology that that lets the theories work, um, and I think that um, you know you you might say that we're confusing the map with the territory and that we're sort of projecting our own you know linguistic or computational biases onto the thing, and I don't see how that can't be the case, right? Um, it's you know the, everything we do is is laden with everything that we know. Um, but, um, but nonetheless, I don't, I don't, I guess I don't see the confusing the map with a territory criticism to actually be that, uh, that devastating of a criticism from the standpoint of what neuroscientists want to do. I think it may be a devastating criticism from the standpoint of, you know, somebody who, who, um, who has like deep commitments to thinking about the metaphysics. I fortunately don't have to do that necessarily. I just want theories that help me actually explain things. And these theories clearly help us explain things in ways that are sort of fundamentally better than the theories that we had say 20 years ago. So for me, that's progress. And, um, and if, we, if the metaphysics can catch up with the epistemology, that's great. But for me, it doesn't have to. So maybe I'll, I'll stop there because I know there are some hands up or maybe I don't know if, if those two want to respond to that as well. Well, uh, it's, it's uh, one hour into what we started, uh, essentially. And, and so what I would like to do is that a lot of, there are a lot of people who, who we, we want this discussion to continue as long as possible. But I would like to have the chance to have uh, students, postdocs, uh, people who haven't been thinking about this for 37 million years to just ask questions or thoughts and, and share your views. So sometimes those questions are the most penetrating ones, given that you haven't been inculcated with all these ways in which we have for the past uh, long time. So I want to make sure that people have a chance to, to uh, see if I, are there hands up or anyone um, I'm trying to go through them. But um, if you if you don't want to ask a question, uh, there's a couple hands up now. Oh, okay, a couple, couple hands. Ah, I see. Okay, so Natalia, uh, would you like to unmute yourself and ask a question, please? Hi. Um, thanks again for you know the amazing talks. I I really enjoyed all three of them, and I definitely learned a lot. Um, my question was for Russ um, about his comment just now about sort of our ontological biases and um, the pragmatism that we need to apply to ontology in order to make sense of anything. Um, my point was kind of that I wouldn't say it's a bias as much as it is something that affects and characterizes every element of our perception to and understanding of ontology itself. So perhaps is it circular to even characterize ontology in any way because you know fundamentally we can't see beyond our human consciousness itself um interesting i mean i i, I guess the first thing i would say is that you know what what you just said for me thinking thinking about it from the, for example the standpoint of like what do we mean by bias in a statistical model we basically mean there's a certain set of outcomes that you know for example you're less likely to see than others um, and so I think that sounds exactly like what I think of as bias. Um, 
you know, as a, again, as a fundamentally as a neuroscientist, you know, I need an ontology to talk about the things I'm doing science on. So, um, so, you know, we have to, we, we have to have one, right. We have to say there are some things that we're studying. Um, you know, I've been interested for a long time in thinking about, you know, the ontology of the mind and asking whether the categories that cognitive psychologists have long used may or may not be sufficient to actually, you know, ascribe function to, to neural systems. Um, so I think that we, you know, I think there's a couple of projects there, right? There's the, the metaphysical project, which is not my project. And then there's the sort of the epistemological project, if you will, of like understanding, or it's, I mean, in some sense, yeah. it's like a cognitive psychology project of understanding, like, what is it, what are the, what's the ontology that's in the mind of the scientist? And is that ontology interfering with their ability to actually understand the system. And I think that certain parts of cognitive psychology probably do interfere in exactly the way that I think is reflected in, in what Mike said, because those those things are, are part and parcel with this kind of classical representational theory of mind. Yeah, thank you. Um, I agree. I guess I've thought about it in the sense of uh, known knowns, unknown unknowns, and um, known unknowns. So when we're talking about ontology and also its connection to epistemology, um, it's almost as if we're tracing, you know, the border of these unknown unknowns and kind of feeling around for them, perceiving them in our ontological gaps, but not quite knowing how to classify this bias. So. I think it's, it's a, yeah, and I think that's exactly right. I think it's a bootstrapping problem, right? We just have yeah. to start somewhere and sort of pull up the boots. Yeah, thank you. Um, any other uh, students or postdocs would like to uh, ask questions? Felipe, you want to um, go ahead then? Yes, in my defense, I have not studied this for 30 million years. <laughs> uh, <laughs> okay. It's great seeing everyone. Thank you so much for putting this uh, together. So I wanted to um, sort of try a different stab at a criticism very similar to, um, to Mike's criticism. Um, when thinking about neural representation, I think that you might want to uh, pick a kind of explanatory domain, right? So there are lots of things about the mind that are fantastic. And I feel that sometimes what Fowler thinks is so super fantastic about the mind is very different from what we think is super fantastic about the mind at the low level vision, right? So for, I take him as thinking, look, the mind is, is the sort of thing that can produce systematic thoughts, that can produce produ pro productive thoughts. You can think many things you have never seen. You, have think, you can think um, of things that are composed of uh, elements that are um, you know, combined in, in, in certain ways such that you can produce just any number of, of thoughts, right? Um, and the kinds of examples that you discuss and that many of the, the deep net networks um, deal with are really low level cases uh, in the sense that they have to do with vision, that they have to do with how we represent things that are outside in the environment. So one worry that I have about the kind of, of, uh, of model uh, of, of representation that you might offer is that you just simply one scale up to stuff that is way more complex. So I can see uh, deep, deep learning models for uh, face recognition or for um, you know, low level visual stuff. But would, we, I, would I ever see uh, a solution in those terms to why is it that I can think that had Trump won the election then such and such would have happened? Can I, th can I see uh, representational theories of the mind in, which, uh, in, in those terms that are going to be representing stuff that has no relationship whatsoever with anything physical um, in which I can think of, right? I can engage in those kinds of thoughts. How would it scale up? And, and what I'm saying is, I'm, I'm not saying anything terribly new. This is exactly what Fuller says to every time or said, every time that any empirically uh, or empirically based theory of representation will come up. So, said it to Smolensky and others when PDP was the, the hot new thing. They said it to Millikan when teleosemantics was a hot new thing. Said it to Andy Clark when, uh, you know. So, so I feel that maybe we're, this is just the same discussion. There's going to be the rationalists like Fowler arguing now against 
the deep learning network peeps. All right, we are in a salon. Uh, Russ? Well, I, was, I just posted in the chat, I'd be interested to see how GPT-3 would respond to Felipe's question. <laughs> <laughs> I Maybe bet it would do pretty that. well. <laughs> That would be, uh, next time we have to incorporate that right into the system of <laughs> arguments. But are, are you going to uh, um, point something out at, at what Felipe said, or you would like to uh, just continue with the discussion or is there anything um, yeah, specific? I, well, I'll just say that I don't, you know, um, nobody's gotten rich underestimating the kinds of problems that um, artificial neural networks can solve in the last few years. Um, obviously, there's a lot of problems they've not solved, and I'm certainly not a, a complete bull, but, um, but I, I'm not, you know, I think you're making a, you're making a claim that may or may not, in the end, it's an empirical claim, right? The, well, I, I don't know if it is actually an empirical claim or not. I'm not sure what it would take for you to, like, if GPT-3 came back and answered your question, in a way that sounded really smart, would you agree that GPT-3 is able to have those kinds of, you know, systematic thoughts, even though it's just an artificial neural network? Hmm. That... What's your gut response? You're thinking too long. Go with uh, the gut. Go with the gut. No, my gut, my gut response is that it's going to be no. I mean, this is this is like a Turing test sort of thing, right? So right, I don't but then wanna... is there anything that could make you say yeah. yes? No, but what if you had a complete like half hour coherent and, and you actually engage with it again? Because that's what Russ is saying. Obviously, you're not, in, we're not want, we don't want a sentence or two or three that sounds smart. You want to engage. So, but I think what Russ is saying is like, I mean, it's a Turing plus version where you engage with it and actually didn't know it wasn't Russ. It was actually some other agent. Would yeah. that probably change your mind? perhaps the, the, the thing that will that will make me uh, pause is the fact that the my interactions with with that kind of system are going to be extremely limited, right? So I would like that 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 system to be able to do the sorts of things that system like us can do, but I don't want to be uh, to embody it necessarily because it sounds uh, a little bit unfair with the Turing test, but. Um, if I could get a GPT-3 that has the systematicity and, 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 uh, and, you know, productivity of thought in the kinds of environments in which we um, exist, then I will probably be willing to say, yes, sure, that thing is representing higher order thinking. Okay. Uh, Kevin, do you want to... Yeah, um, thanks very much. And thanks to everyone for the great, um, for the great conversation. I just, well, first I wanted to respond to Felipe's... Um, question, which I, I don't really see the problem with, I guess. It's true that most of the work on representations has been on low level perceptual stuff, you know, but it builds up to, to higher order perceptual stuff and categories and types of things and relations between things. And once, you, once you're there, you're into, you're into abstract thought, I think, and, and you have patterns of neural activity that represent a type of relation between things. And then I, I don't see I don't see a limit to that, that, you know, once you have a kind of enough recursive um, ammunition uh, or levels, I, I don't see why you can't have representations of, of, of thoughts and categories. Um, but I had a, a broader question, I guess, which is really, um, I guess, to the speakers, what they see as, as being at stake in this debate over whether we use the term representations, how we use it, whether it applies at all. I mean, I know that Many inactivists don't don't like it and say that there's no such thing. There may be some confusion between neural representations and mental representations. For me, if something is a, a neural pattern that's about something uh, and it's for something for the organism, representation is a perfectly good word for that. Especially if it's if it's um, I guess in an internal layer that's not not immediately coupled to action but can be communicated to other parts of the brain and other parts of the system. That, it seems like we can't not have that in the brain. It seems like that's how the brain works. It's how it connects the organism to the environment. So is it just semantics about, you know, the, the whether we apply the term representation to that, or is there something deeper, you know, much more fundamental at stake? Because it seems you have that even in, in deep learning and even in dynamical systems. 
Ines or Michael or Russ want to take this? I'm going to say something brief, but I see Bryce's hand up and I'm sure he has something to say about this exact. OK, question. sorry. Yeah, I do. Wow. Yeah, go ahead, Bryce. No, mine is a subsequent question, so I will follow up. Well, I just want to say I, I think there is something deeper at stake and it has to do with cognitive architecture. And um, I don't think Russ is guilty of this, uh, this, but many, many of his colleagues are. They're assuming the cognitive architecture assumed by cognitive psychology, which itself was borrowed from uh, a particular kind of representational theory of mind. And I think the evidence suggests that that's not the kind of cognitive architecture we in fact have. So whether we want to call these entities representations or not, that is just a semantic distinction. But when scientists uh, and philosophers uh, uh, engage with the empirical literature and assume that some of these findings are supporting a particular kind of cognitive architecture, which has representation at its center, that's just a, I think that's just a mistake, right? I think, I think, uh, was, I know I'm a Gibsonian, right? So, uh, I think the right explanations have to do not with representation, not with, the, with model building, not with the reproduction of the world, but with the ability of our uh, embodied brains to coordinate with the world. And I think the structures that Russ has described are clearly candidates for part of the causal underpinnings of our capacity to coordinate with the world, but that doesn't make them sort of representations in that, in that classical sense, right? That doesn't make them parts of large scale models of the world. That we then calculate over. Um, and if you haven't read the, the you know the famous paper, what what could cognition be if not computation? Uh, I would urge you to do it because that's that's a really nice statement of you know what the assumptions are behind representational theory in mind and, and how those change when you embrace a more dynamic systems account. Kevin, do you want to follow up or no? That... No, I mean I think that's great, and I it. it um... I mean, it, it clarifies the baggage, right, that's coming with the term, where it's not the term itself that's objectionable to some people, it's that it's been used to, to represent this architecture versus that one. And I think that's really interesting. But I, uh, I mean, I guess I would also say, I don't see as big a gulf between the, the inactive approach and the more computational one, or between the dynamic approach and a more computational one. I think those can be reconciled there's benefits, there's clear things that are right about both aspects to me anyway. Um, and the, it, it seems that they can be married together, but maybe there's a, I mean, I'm coming into this field from, from outside as a geneticist. Um, so it, it, for me, I'm, I, don't, I'm, I haven't been inculcated in these things. So sometimes I'm a bit bemused why, um, mm -hmm. you know, what the implications are for, for people, but it's because they're loaded terms, I guess. Yeah, no, I completely agree. And I've said so in print that, that these things are not in fact incompatible, but you have to have the right understanding and you have to understand what role representations and computation and, and these other things play. And you know, computational theory mind got it wrong. And so when people think they're supporting computational theory of mind, uh, that's just a mistake. Um, and uh, anyway, so I'll, I'll stop. There's more people Great. wanting to jump Thanks in Thanks very much. Uh, Bryce, do you wanna go ahead? Yeah, so, so this is mostly for us. And what, what I was thinking about is when you look at these papers like the DiCarlo type stuff, they're never hitting uh, complete mapping relations to the structure of what's going on in the neural structures. And there's always gaps there. It's unclear whether the gaps are in our understanding of the neurobiology or whether it's in the structure of the particular algorithms that are being used. But there are multiple algorithms that can do roughly as well as one another at capturing the observed pat patterns in the data. And one of the things that that gets me wondering about is what exactly it is that we're tracking when we're able to extract these patterns of covariance between the kinds of computational models you're talking about and the kinds of structures that are present in the brain. And the one other thing that I wanted to tack onto that, which is something that I think is something we always need to keep in mind is that there's all sorts of um, regulatory stuff going on constantly in the neural circuits too, that are not going on in the same way 
with the computational systems. And the question is, how much are those going to really matter? Um, how much does it matter that the circuits are bathed in norepinephrine or that there's a, a current density of serotonin in the system or whatever else it is that is kicking around? I think those are those are both great questions. Let me address the last one first, which is I think you're right that you know that there's there's all sorts of interesting features of neural systems that aren't present in these models, and so that might make you think that the fact that the models can do so well at you know predicting activity, even though as as you mentioned they don't predict it perfectly, um, that that's you know that's that's really interesting. And I think you know there there are clear also examples of sort of degeneracy in you know Eve Martyr's work being kind of the famous example of this, or even in really simple neural systems. Um, you know, you can have a wide landscape of different particular tunings of, you know, of features in the neural network that can give you the same behavior at, at the higher level. Um, so, you know, I think, back to your question then of like what, you know, what, so, sorry, let me just finish that. So I think that there's going to be some parts of the brain where it matters a lot more than others. Clearly, like, you know, prefrontal cortex, this stuff probably matters more than it does in primary visual cortex. So clearly it matters somewhat everywhere, but we've done pr decently, at least with primary visual cortex, um, without kind of, you know, incorporating that stuff greatly. Um, so, you know, back to the question then of like, you know, what is it that we're, what is it that we're capturing? Um, I guess one way that I might think about this, and I'd need to think about it more, but one way I might think about it is in terms of sort of, you know, levels of organization. So uh, WIMSAT has this great idea of like, you know, different kind of, you know, levels of density in the, in the phase space of, of reality, right? That, you know, that for basically that, you know, that if you think about like, what is it that what what's the what's the the structure of the world you know in some ways you know what our visual system i think wants to do and what these neural networks also want to do or at least what will make them effective is when they basically build a, a, a generative model of the images that are hitting our retina right that you basically want to invert those images to figure out where they came from right and um and so to the degree that there are kind of different levels of of organization in the in the generative process of the world, then um, it may well be that to some degree, the levels that we see in the visual system or an artificial neural network map to some degree onto those different levels of organization in the, the system that generated the data that we're then trying to process. Um, that's my initial kind of stab at this. I just want to ask just a, a quick clarification to Russ and maybe others that might want to speak to this. Maybe uh, Nick Nicholas uh, Krigus Corden might want to speak to this too. One thing that I always find puzzling is that uh, a lot of people seem really impressed with the performance of these systems, and I, I don't know. I might be an impossible person to convince, or I just whatever a crank. But I I don't find it convincing at all because to me it seems like you're taking these extremely artificial things you're feeding one image or you know like your cat i mean adorable but you know it's just one cat with one little hat it's not the cat in the world moving and i'm moving and i'm i'm in a certain context and i'm i have a certain goal and so i think those situations are so impoverished and temporally you know, you're not looking at feedback. I mean, you, you describe the systems as, as highly hierarchical, but you know, we know exhaustively about all the, the feedback and, and the lack of hierarchy. And the V1 goes to multiple regions simultaneously. V2, there's always bypass connections and whatnot. So I don't, if the prediction is just, if you're not talking about prediction being temporal, I'm predicting a pattern, a spatial temporal pattern of activation in, v, in, in across visual cortex. I don't find it impressive at all. But again, you know, sure, it makes a lot of money. You can you can read license plates, and and that's how the garage in my my university is. It's read automatically the the, the license plates. But I, I don't know. I just don't find it impressive. I, I, well, I maybe... so this is yeah. So you know, one person's impressive is another person's not impressive. Um, but 
and I, you know, it's not the, it's not so much the, um, with respect to the arguments that I'm making here, it's not so much the fact that these neural networks can recognize faces and cats and read license plates and all that stuff that impresses me. What impresses me is the ability to predict almost all of the explainable variants in neural activity in multiple areas in the visual system from the readout of just a linear readout from a neural but, network layer, right? But it's that, something incredibly a, you impoverished. You cannot do that unless you're getting something right about- No, I agree that there's something no, because it's so it. impoverished, right? So if I'm actually exposing, let's say I study you, let's say just for argument's sake that we humans are extremely complex and, and do things in, in really sophisticated ways. But when I put them in the laboratory and I just flash something and I ask you to respond something, I'm getting some- such an impoverished view of the processing of the visual system that will lead me to think that important features are color and this and that and whatnot, and then have some kind of Treisman important theory from the eighties, but you know, it's, it, we had to move on from it. So what I'm saying is that we're doing the same thing with the, these neural networks as we've done with the studying of perception and cognition in the laboratory. It's so impoverished that we have such a, uh, distorted image of what really is the visual cap the visual capabilities or the cognitive capabilities or the cognitive capabilities because you're studying you ask me to you know is, is this arrow pointing this way or that way and there's a third arrow so yeah there's a little bit of a conflict there that it gets at some essential component of cognitive control but it's so impoverished so I just to me I, I just um I think it's fantastic what we see in the match and it's impressive. But I think as a scientist, I try to keep in mind that the, the limits of what we're doing. So I, 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 I'm a little surprised sometimes when people find it really impressive. But I, again, you know, I'll, I'll stop there. I'm interested to hear what others have to say. Nick, do you want to uh, say something? Yeah, sure. What a fun discussion. This, this is fascinating. This last exchange was especially uh, delicious for me. I think you're, you're both sort of right on many fundamental uh, points. And uh, this tension there is, is extremely interesting. Um, but I'd, I'd add a, a couple of points that maybe relate these two perspectives. First, when you say neural networks, Lewis, you mean uh, deep feed forward convolutional neural networks, right? And that's a very limited framework and actually not what anyone literally believes, right? And I agree with you that these are very impoverished. And I would argue that especially because they are so impoverished, that makes it impressive that they can explain uh, a substantial amount of variance. Uh, I don't think they reach the noise ceiling for any but very sort of impoverished data sets. Like we had a very impoverished data set and then it was very close to the noise ceiling. But when we have slightly less impoverished data sets and they don't reach the noise ceiling, but for uh, primary visual cortex, our best models also don't reach the noise ceiling. And now we're doing just about as well in, in IT as we're doing in primary visual cortex. And that was always impossible before for novel images, right? So clearly there is substantial computational mechanistic uh, progress there. But at the same time, this is only scratching the surface when we're thinking about the brain and cognitive functions more broadly. So I agree with, with Michael also that there is a substantive issue that there is um, you know, entirely uh, uh, different processes when we get to higher cognitive functions and there are the, the, the struggles in machine learning to make these models generalized better to novel situations. So this is uh, a big step forward for AI, but also shows all the current limitations. And what's missing is exactly what uh, our brains are additionally capable of doing and whether that is the kind of mechanism that the representational theory of mind sort of got at or not, that I think is, is an open question. I wouldn't give up on that too quickly, right? And on this, this um, question of representations, um, to me, I, I often see less contradictions than maybe other, other, other speakers here, because I have a, a lightweight conception of representation. I think of representation 
as a language for describing a complex system, much like information theory. So it's not about saying um, there are systems in the world that are information theoretic and there are others that are not information theoretic, but rather there are, uh, you can use the language of information theory to, to describe a system. And one level up um, is representational interpretations. So that's also a language. It sort of subsumes information theory, but it adds something to it, uh, which is uh, the semantic level, the intentionality of those representations. And that's just useful. And that's the reason why um, neuroscientists have found the cognitive concept of representation irresistible, because it is so useful for making sense of neural activity to be able to embed it in what it, how it relates the organism to its environment. Right? We just need that. And we can conceptualize that more simply with a low cognitive bar, that, and that's what neuroscientists have done. Or we can conceptualize that in a more sophisticated manner, as philosophers have done. And I think that's both of these are correct in a way. We just have to define our, our terminology, and then um, this language can be very useful to us if we are, we're careful with it. Yeah, Nick, let me just respond super quick to that. One, one caution I would urge is when we talk about information theory, people tend to think of Shannon information. And for lots of reasons, Shannon information is a really inappropriate way to think about the kinds of information that the brain is dealing with. And so, yes, in some sense, the brain is an information processing system, and it's very usefully thought of that way. But it's not a message passing system. It's not Shannon information. There's a different kind of uh, information that the brain trucks in. Uh, and so th that's another one of those you know, historical things that people take on board without necessarily recognizing how different the reality is from the, you know, from the 1950s theory. Can I just quickly respond to that? So th this is maybe another example where my my view is a little different because I think you know you can analyze the information content in terms of Shannon information. So, for example, you can estimate the mutual information between stimulus and resp response, and you'd be using the concept of Shannon information. And that's just an analysis. That's not sort of saying anything deep about the brain, other than that there is a statistical dependency between the stimulus and the response, and maybe it's useful to quantify it. And that's what computational neuroscientists have done. So for me, that is not like a deep theoretical claim that is wrong. Uh, I don't even know what the claim is, so I can't find it wrong either. I, I see it as a tool. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, Roberto, you want to? Actually, sorry, before you go, I have oh. to run. I just wanted to thank everybody. It's been a really great discussion. Um, and uh, hopefully you can uh, carry on and let me know what you uh, what you come up with. Hey, Brad. Thanks, Russ. Great talk. Thanks. Bye bye. Thanks. Thanks, Russ. Thanks so much. Um... Uh, I'll try to be very quick because I have the impression that, that I'm holding everyone for going <laughs> on with their days. So there's kind of one ingredient that, that I'm a, a, a little bit missing, but it's probably a, the, that I didn't get it right. So I, I do a, a fair amount of deep learning. Um, and to me, it, it's, it's quite surprising sometimes the results that you get, but you can also get very, very surprising results in terms of dimensionality reduction by properly using a PCA. You know, just a, a nice principal component analysis or an SVD can get stuff from your data that you wouldn't imagine. But every time, what you will get is a summary of the data. So what the representations that you will get at most will be equal to the data. I'm, I'm very interested in brain development. And in brain development, most of what you see in, in, in the creation of an organism is kind of intrinsic, you know, like there's there's no summarization of the data that will make an, an arm appear or, 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 or an eye appear. So there, there's this idea of, of constraint in, 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 in theoretical biology that I think it's very important. So there's, this is, we're talking about a system that has a lot of uh, internal intrinsic dynamics. So it's able to produce, a, it's, it's already very, very complex. So I, I think that it, me sometimes and my colleagues very often we use representation for lack of a better word, but I think that what we are observing when we have when we record signals that are, seem to correspond or correlate with some external stimulus is, it should be more like 
of the sort of a co coupling, you know, then, then a representation. You have a system that comes with a lot of inner structure. That structure seems to be coupled with, with stuff that happens outside. And it's not a representation. What we have is not less than the data. What we have is more than the data. Uh, it, it reminds me to, to some extent what, what Chomsky was talking about, like, like human nature, you know, like for, for language, there's no way he was arguing that, that, that you could get everything necessary for creating language uh, just from the data. If that were the case, I don't know, like uh, chimps would be able to talk and they are not. So you, you bring this human nature and, 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 and what you have is this, this sort of coupling with, with the environment more than actually something that's less or a, reduce dimension version of the of the environment. Mm, yeah, and that's a challenging claim. So you're basically saying that the the, the view that uh, that you are extracting things from the environment, you get at most what you have, but in your view, it's actually go beyond because it's embedded in some larger context and maybe and uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I think that if we say representation is just for lack of a better word, in the I had the same feeling when we say computation or the brain is computing a representation. It's like the, 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 there's, you know, the, there's a functioning of some coupling uh, with the environment. I think that it's just the, the, the opposite of representation is not anti-representation, it's probably coupling or something like that, of that sort. Kevin, you wanted to um, say I something? Yeah, I just wanted to respond to Roberto. I'm sorry okay, for coming in, again, coming in again. It's just that struck a chord with me. And um, I, I think that's right. You know, the idea of a passive representation is clearly wrong. The brain is clearly actively um, inferring things about the data. And, and for me, I guess the representations are not, you know, it's not a representation of, a, of an object in the world. It's the representation of a belief that there's an object in the world. And it, it could be mistaken and so on. But in a sense, the system, it, yeah, it's, it's, it, the representat representation results from the interaction of the system with the information that's coming in. And in that sense, it does add more than just the raw data because you've got higher order abstraction that uh, is not just a crude coarse graining of the data. It's, uh, it's a motivated coarse graining of the data for things that are salient for the organism. So, so for me, that's an interactive constructive process. And then, but you can still have things that are then the, the, the product of that process may still be internally represented, if that makes sense. I don't see a conflict. I see it as, as, a, as a nuance maybe uh, that it's not just a passive image processing, it's an active image parsing and labeling. Um, with the, 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 all of the resources and the historical experience of the organism brought to bear on that in a constructive uh, relationship, I guess. Johan? Uh, thanks everyone for very interesting presentations. And uh, one thing I th which I think builds on what Kevin just said, uh, and also one of um, Russ's slides about the reactivation uh, in mouse cortex, was it? Um, is like no one has mentioned the word imagination really so far. And to my mind, uh, explaining imagination, like me thinking about a dragon right now, is a perfect case of using representation in precisely the way that he was using it uh, even in that mouse reactivation um, study. And you could force the concept of coupling into this, but I don't see how coupling helps you explain anything when we're relying so strongly on combinatorics of memory. So does, would anyone like to elaborate on uh, representation in the context of imagination? If I could say one thing to what Johan said, uh, because I, I'm about to leave, but I couldn't because I think you're exactly right. So um, one of my uh, biggest concerns with, with certain models and counterfactual thinking, which is one of the things that I study in the lab, is, is uh, you know, when you engage in imaginations of what ifs, um, computational models are extremely bad at those. Uh, not only because you have to solve problems like one shot learning, uh, but also because it is unclear how do you can find the space of logical possibilities that are to be searched. Uh, models are not usually very good at fitting exactly what people are doing and people are extraordinarily variable. 
And that is, um, is a very, very tricky area of, uh, of work in artificial intelligence. Um, and is one area in which we have pretty bad models in the sense of being very uh, incapable of feeding behavioral data from human subjects. Uh, so yeah, I, I agree with you. I treat them as imaginations. I mean, this is a, a concern that I even have with, with um, embodied programs like Tony Cameras and, and, and so forth, in which I love the idea of thinking about uh, cognition as dynamical system. But when I am in a bus daydreaming for half an hour about killing dragons and playing Dungeons and Dragons and so on and so forth, I have a, a hard time thinking of that long process, cognitive process, in which there is zero movement in dynamical terms. It might be possible that there is, uh, that there is just some work out there that I am not that really familiar with, but those seem to be instances in which the notion of representation is essential. And what the representation is mapping is literally something that does not exist in the world. Uh, so so right. I have, I, I think, think that, that, yeah. that that's one tricky context, right? That's yeah. interesting, Felipe, because Buzaki's work, uh, paper, uh, book talks about these kinds of things in the following sense that it is true that you can do that uh, now that you're at this age and you go on a bus, but that required this whole bootstrapping of your entire life that required your ability to be engaged with enough situations and contexts that now allows you to kind of so go a little bit go offline. But um, yeah, I mean, that's so the he, principle behind a lot of, of mental simulation theories, right? So they, okay. So they, Corruption hypothesis is like that. Is is the idea, and it has been like that since Hume. You put together, uh, okay. you never in a unicorn. You just see horses and horns, and then you just sort of uh, put them together. Um, but th those combinatorics. I, the, I'm just talking about computer programs to 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 engage in that kind of mental simulation. They're, they're see, tricky. Okay. They don't fit. It might be possible that in the future they will they will work. But um, explaining to a to to a um, computational model, why is it that when I have a pizza in my hand um, and it falls, the first thing that pops to my mind is, oh, shoot, had I been able to catch it, um, I would have been able to eat it again. And not a counterfactual like, oh, if only I live in a country in which it was socially acceptable to think to eat things off the floor, or if only I lived in a, in a, in a moment in time in which the laws of gravity had changed. So those are all equally valid counterfactuals, but they don't occur to people. So understanding exactly in computational terms, why is it that certain imaginations pop to mind rather than mm -hmm. others is extremely tricky. Uh, and, uh, and so I, I think that that's a challenge, that there are certain areas of imaginations that are very challenging for current computational models. Yeah, no, for sure, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, we're closer to the issues of, of representation in neuroscience that we discussed. Are there any pending Pending ideas or questions that people have, or have we exhausted uh, everyone or all the questions? Let's see. There's. Let's see. There's one. Your hand, Johan, is still up. Is big from before, or? Uh, no, I had. I thought we could return to the ontology question because. Okay, let's go. Yeah, sure. So of course. A couple of you know well-known references. There's a the famous Norbert Wiener and Arturo Rosenbluth quote. The best material model of a cat is another or preferably the same cat. And the reason I bring this up, it's related to that Borges thing about the map that's coterminous with the territory. These kinds of maps are useless. So like, it's good that you brought up the map territory thing, but, and, and maybe this is something that philosophers will have to like deal with in, in, in conversation with scientists is that scientists are constructing maps. They're very aware that they're constructing maps. Some are more useful than others but we're always going to be confronted with, with what I like to call the Mercury-Neptune dilemma. So when uh, Neptune was discovered, the way that it was discovered was because of an anomaly in the orbit of one of the planets. And so that was considered a great validation of Newtonian physics. But then one century later, when there was a similar discrepancy with Mercury, uh, they tried doing the same thing and they did not find this hidden planet on the other side of the sun. Instead, it was necessary to revise the theory. So in that situation, can we say that representation is like that or like atoms? Like once upon a time, people said told Boltzmann, atoms are just a convenience. So uh, 
why would a philosopher want to commit to this, uh, uh, to saying, to being like someone who said that atoms don't exist, right? Like, surely it is the integration between theory and experiment going forward that justifies uh, the use of a concept. So now when we don't know how anything works, why would we want to preempt the notion of representation? Ines, you would, are, are you, um, you want to take on that one or? Because I think it's uh, somewhat addressing. Okay, before, before Ines does it, I'm, I'm terribly sorry, but I do have to run. I've got another meeting. Uh, okay, I'm no, of course. Yeah, no, thank you so for much. including me, Ines. Right. Uh, thank you, Ines, uh, for, for your talk. So this has been great, Louise. You, you're putting together these philosophy uh, and neuroscience salams has been fantastic. Oh, yeah, that's so awesome. Thank you. Thank you for that effort. And sure. thank you everybody else for coming and I will hopefully see you all maybe even in real life at some point. <laughs> Good luck to all of us. Yeah. Ciao. So Ines, would you like to um, um, reply to Johan's point or? Yes, absolutely. Um, I think that uh, it's right on point. I quite like the way that he formulated the problem. And um, I'm, I'm, I completely agree. And I also liked um, that um, there was a sort of like an awkward silence after he, he posed the question because precisely right, who wants to answer that question? That's exactly why we're here, isn't it? And um, I do want to say that um, it is, it is um, I think, dangerous to do that, but it's also very useful. <laughs> to, I mean, to, to suppose uh, or to use that kind of language when we refer to, to neural neural activity, etc. by the reasons that I was pointing out, I think, and then many, many or that uh, many others that uh, many of the people have pointed out. Um, and now I think that trying to answer that question and going back to uh, Russ's paper, I wanted to say that one thing that I find absolutely fascinating is fascinating, and he mentioned that, and I think it was it, it, we, we should also not lose sight of that. Um, when he mentions these systematic relations between neurons and the things in the world, such as there are these relations between things in the world and the activity in the brain. And I think this is um, really important for us not to lose sight of that. Uh, I find it fascinating that um, we could, we can in principle look inside the brain alone, and for example, the visual system, uh, and its connectivity and patterns of activation, etc. And we could infer about how the world looks like just by looking at the visual system. And that's precisely because you know, there is that relation that Russ was talking about that is really important and that we are all uh, trying to understand uh, those relations. So um, I think that he also shows this uh, in the paper and that's what I, what I most, most liked. But I'm just not convinced, and now going back, to um, Johan's uh, a question that really left this awkward silence that I liked in the room. Um, I think that assuming that there are um, these, um, I'm not convinced that these mapping, the relations between what's happening in the brain, and there are these relations obviously, and uh, the world um, outside of the brain, um, that these would that we would need to assume these representations of the computationalist kind or in, that are very information based or um, Shannon information as Michael was referring to. I don't think that we need to do that. I think there is a tendency to do that for many various reasons, but I don't think that we need that. And that's exactly the question I think that Johan was, was posing. I think there are many other ways that we can talk about these things without having to commit and, um, and also having to defend that, which I don't think it is that easy because um, I know that Russ doesn't want to, and was very clear, I'm not doing ontology, not doing metaphysics, right? So I'm not doing ontology, was very clear about that. But the thing is that, um, that we need to be um, mindful about is that when we say that uh, neuronal activity entails, leverages, or is representational, we are making an ontological claim, even if we don't want to work or, or do ontology, right? But we are making an ontological claim. And the question is on what basis are we making this claim? That's a philosophical question. So I think it is important. And that's why I sort of like try to refrain from making those ontological claims, but look at all of this um, wonderful work that is being uh, done as uh, epistemic tools that allow us to understand and predict um, these things that we are interested on in cognitive science. All right. <laughs>
Why are we making ontological claims? We don't have to, right? Only if we if we have that inter impulse that interpretation on it. I would say, I, I don't think of it like that at all. I use representational language because that helps me understand at a very high level how the things happening in the brain relate to the world around the organism. And I find that useful and important and it's part of what motivates me. And so I want to also be able to describe things like that in my papers, but with an understanding that I don't think that that is a, a falsifiable hypothesis about the brain. It doesn't mean that there is any uh, level of complexity where I, I wouldn't, where, where representational language could no longer be applied, right? At what level would that happen? Simple animals, uh, single cell animals or artifacts such as pocket calculators or thermostats can all be uh, understood in terms of representing the world. It seems a little bit silly for a thermostat, but it's not impossible. Um, so for me, it's just um, impossible to draw a line there. And therefore I accept that it's just a useful language rather than a theory. Right. Uh, Natalia, do you want to ask a question? Uh, yeah, I just wanted to say, um, I agree with you, Inez, that, um, you know, saying that you don't want to make an ontological claim is making a claim about metaphysics and ontology. But at the same time, you can say counter to that, um, you know, everything that we're making any type of claim about is ultimately ontological because we're making these claims via our own knowledge or own experience. And so, you know, ultimately we just run into this very circular issue where we suppose the existence of things that we can't possibly imagine or perceive. And it's like, well, you know, okay, we vaguely imagine these things, but like we can't perceive them, we can't measure them. And so we run back into the same issue, if that makes sense. Um, and so I'm just not sure if it's useful at all to kind of say that we're making any specific ontological claim, because ultimately the ontology that we're discussing is the one that we're naturally limited to. So I'm kind of, I, I wonder what your thoughts on that are and kind of, you know, if there's any way of um, breaking through the circular type of inference of ontological processes that I'm attempting to describe. Right, so let me, let me, let me ask a, a simple follow-up, uh, it's related, which is, okay, so for those who are more philosophically, philosophically knowledgeable and, and can explain a little bit more clearly, so what, what, how could I, so is it possible for a neuroscientist, so my, I guess my question is, is it possible for a neuroscientist or a nurse, a, a scientist, I guess, for that matter, to do science about the object of his or her science without ontological commitment. So it's, 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 it can, can't it be all some, some kind of epistemic type of approach that you're trying to see the utility of, of some constructs or types of approach or what have you in terms of um, what some could claim would be a form of understanding of what's going on. So, but I, I, I'm obviously not a philosopher, so maybe I'm just, um, not understanding why that necessarily entails some strong form of ont ontological position. Could I, um, Kevin, yeah. Yeah, thanks, Louise. Um, I, I think I agree with uh, Nicholas on this, that it doesn't have to um, necessarily. And um, I know Natalia would argue that, you know, any, even that claim is is taking an ontological position, but um, I don't think they, it, to me, a lot of the, the discussion around representations gets bogged down when we try to think of them as objects. And then we're describing the ontology of them as a thing, as opposed to representation as something, a verb that the circuits are doing for the organism in the service of its behavior. And to me, that's far less um, controversial to say, well, it is doing that activity um, and it's for something, it, you know, there's a pattern of neural activity that has meaning for the organism because it can use it to do this. And so, whereas to, to think of the pattern as an object, which is then operated on in, in, in some abstract way, uh, 
to me, gets us into, gets us into some trouble. And, and that is an ontological claim that I, I don't think we need to make. At least that's, that's my feeling about it. And um, for, for me, the, it's the meaning of the thing for the organism that's the most important thing. And I guess it comes back to what Michael said to my earlier question, that the, the controversy stems from the baggage, the implications that people take someone to mean uh, when they use the word, so they take someone to be meaning that they um, commit to the entire computational theory of mind, for example, if they use the word of a representation, which isn't necessarily the case. And, and for me, I guess the way to maybe simplify that without making these commitments to grand edifices is to take a very task-oriented view. What is the organism using this uh, pattern of activity for? And what does it relate to in the world? Uh, right. And that task task oriented framing for me can but, you know, maybe sidestep some of the ontol ontological right. But you know. Kevin, that's really interesting because that's as my reading is that that's not the typical way that people in neuroscience would be thinking about it. Because so you're making a much more verb or action oriented type of description. So there's this kind of representing going on, yeah. and but for instance, does that the was that does that resonate with some of your thinking, Nicholas? So is it, um, or is, in, in essence, does it make sense to try to separate a noun from a verb or is this like gets, gets a little too, it is not necessary. It's like, it just, uh, we're, we're worrying too much about something that is not at the, at the essence of it. Yeah, that's actually a very interesting point, Kevin. And it, uh, it resonates with me. I, I think it, it kind of makes sense. Uh, I think, when we're thinking more concretely about a particular model, for example, a, a neural network model where you have lay, layers and you have patterns of activity and they're elicited by images, then it might also be defensible to say, this is the representation and it's, it's operated on by this discrete dynamical system that transforms these over time. But in a more general uh, sense, when we're not thinking in the context of a particular model, then I, I agree with you that it might be better um, to think of it as a process and also more consistent with the, the dynamical view of things. But just to zoom out one step um, on this ontological um, question. So from, for me, the way I think about it is in terms of languages and statements that you make in those languages, right? And what sometimes happens is that we confuse a language with a statement. And then we think the language should be empirically falsifiable or should be true or not true, or it should be true of these things in the world and not these other things. And this is what we have to be careful about and then make our, our choice as to how to um, think about these. So I think of um, representations as a language. So that is neither right or wrong, but the things that I say in that language they can be empirically falsified. Otherwise, I wouldn't be an empirical scientist, right? So once I commit to this language, then I have something where the structure of which is in science, uh, essentially, as Ines was describing, cultural. These are tools that I use to represent the world. And these tools don't reflect the thing that they're representing. They're just my, my language. And then I use that language to express particular theories and these can fail and by rejecting them, we make progress. And I would actually see neural networks, um, which do not bias into the concept of representation. They're just a mechanistic framework for modeling information processing in the brain as another language like that. Neural networks can also not be rejected on empirical grounds as a whole, but a particular neural network model can be rejected because it might not predict the activity patterns for novel stimuli right, or might exactly. not predict them as well as another one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's a great point, Sam. Yeah. Okay, it's almost two. Uh, sorry, it's almost the hour. It's it's a different time everywhere in the world. So <laughs> so so it's almost at the hour. Um, uh, what a the last uh, pending burning questions that we still have before we wrap it up. I wouldn't mind saying something. Yes, please, please. Okay, so I think that, um, yeah, this is a very interesting 
Um, and just one final thought I was just here thinking about um, is that I think the important question here, such that we sort of address the ontological epistemic uh, way of uh, understanding or, or segue into uh, representations is that is whether representations or neuronal representations, not mental representations, but at least neuronal representations, whether they are a scientific fact. Because if they are not a scientific fact, um, then the follow-up question is whether we are taking them as an assumption that they exist uh, in neuronal activity and uh, they exist so that they're leveraging the design as well as the interpretation of our results, in which case we are um, sort of in line with ontological assumptions or ontological claims. Um, the other alternative um, is, I think, more in line with not what Nicholas was, uh, was pursuing. It's, it's useful. It's useful to talk and use um, this uh, concept, this language, even though we know that neurons are not full agents that represent meanings, in which case the use of this language would serve an epistemic role. So that's just like my final thoughts on the matter. Any final, final thoughts? Have we made any progress? I think I think we have. I think I, I feel that we have made some progress. Uh, it was, was I think it was very productive. I, I thought it was really good. Okay, everyone, uh, I'm going to uh, end the session here and get the recording. It uh, takes a little while to get the recording uh, on the computer thing here, and but uh, by tomorrow sometime or later today, I'll definitely uh, have it posted and share the link. Uh, these are. These are part of the series, so we'll have it there for forever for people who want to go back to some segment or encourage others to to take a peek. But uh, I think it was I think it was really good. Maybe maybe one of the best that we had so far. So thanks so much, everyone. Thanks for organizing, Luis. This is right, my, my pleasure. Yeah. Thanks so yeah. much. It was a pleasure. Thanks Thank a you. Bye bye, everyone. Bye, take all. care.